that it wasn't. Um, Nazi Germany attempted to colonize all of Europe and the rest of the world. There were the fascists in Italy. Um, however, after going through that struggle, uh, the concept of human equality became very important. And it, it was established at the time of the United Nations. It's very recent. It, it's somewhat a surprise to find that the principle of human equality that we all feel is so important now was really only established in international law um, at, after World War II. But if you think about it, colonialism could never have worked if that principle had not been, res had been respected. Um, just about every document that's put out at the United Nations starts with a reiteration of the principle of human equality. Um, you would think that would be enough, but of course it wasn't. And so in 1961, there was a formal rejection of colonialism at the uh, United Nations. Of course, there were huge discussions about that, and I've got a few minutes to talk to you. And the book even had to cover a lot of material very briefly. Um, however, um, the International Court of Justice supported the rejection of colonialism, even for people that didn't have a colonized state. They said that integration in another state must be the result of the freely expressed wishes of the territory's people acting with full knowledge of the change in their status, their wishes having been expressed through informed and democratic processes, impartially conducted and based on universal adult suffrage. Uh, it takes a moment, it's a lot of words. Um, people might want to reflect on that a bit. Um, the Quebec secession reference um, affirmed that in Canada in the reverse. Um, saying that there needed to be uh, consent of the majority of the people on a clear question. Um, however, that standard wasn't really respected when Canada left the British Empire. Um, probably, I don't know if anyone in this room realizes it, but uh, anyone bef uh, born uh, before 1982 was still a British subject as well as being a Canadian citizen. But British subject status ended as a formal legal status on the 1st of January, 1983. And I don't uh, recall ever being asked to vote on that issue. Um, it, it's something that uh, was part of a paradigm change that happened and people just assumed it was okay. In the book I discuss quite a bit uh, the differences between colonialism and post-colonialism. Um, and I found that uh, colonial law is ex uh, involves an externally imposed normative system that's instituted by force, be it social, economic, or military, to uphold an unequal distribution of social, economic, and cultural resources so that some are denied a political voice and excluded from the process of determining laws and social rules. By contrast, post-colonialism involves laws that are self-determined by the people to whom they apply. And if anyone thinks about the formation of Canada, um, they will know that indigenous people did not participate in the determination of Canadian laws. And allowing some indigenous people to become members of parliament uh, does not satisfy that requirement because they're not representing indigenous constituencies or indigenous nations. They've joined Canada and they're representing Canadian people and they can be very good representatives of Canadian people but they've made the decision to become Canadian. They're not representing um, the Haida Nation or the Mi'kmaq Nation, and the interests of those people aren't being taken into account. Um, Post-colonial laws are based on consensual processes involving informed public discussion and accountable governments that aim for an egalitarian distribution of power and resources across a society um, that respects 
uh, alternate opinions, minority rights, and social differences. Now, um, going over all of that, I'm sure a lot of you can think of a lot of ways in which we have to struggle for those things in Canada right now, even in the majority population. When I was reading the 65 cases, which are, it's long 65 cases, um, I assessed the cases as I read them for indicia of both colonial and post-colonial legality. A post-colonial um, judgment um, at the far end of the scale, which is, um, requires a rejection of hierarchy, because hierarchy gives privilege to some people over others. It would have to be a pure decision. Um, we're far from having that in Canada. Um, at the other extreme end of that scale, um, in a, a, a highly colonial decision maker comes from an alien culture, um, it might be a dictator who doesn't even bother consulting any representatives. They make the decision, they um, don't explain it, they just tell you this is it, it's a law because I said so. Um, in a colonial culture, people have to operate under an imposed identity. And I would like to remind people that before colonization, there was no such thing as Aboriginal people in North America. There were a series of nations. Um, uh, now in Canada, in our law and in general thinking, people act as if the Mi'kmaq and the Cree and the Haudenosaunee and the Haida, I might not even be using the proper names for some of these people, as if they're all representing the same thing. And people often think that if you find someone with indigenous an ancestry, they can represent all the rest, even though they don't know anything about them. It's a little bit like thinking that it, once you've met a Norwegian, you know what an Italian is like. It's, um, there are a lot of differences in uh, sentiment and political order between the different indigenous nations. We need to learn more about those if we want to understand how to accommodate differences. Um, in a colonial legal system, court is conducted in a foreign language and culture. Issues are imposed on people. Um, the procedure is in camera, and it may be biased. You don't have to know what the thought processes are. Um, you don't have to prove uh, what you take for facts. You can base your facts on assumptions. Uh, your concept of law is imposed, uh, reasoning is declaratory, values are authoritarian, and the perspective tends to be very ethnocentric or egocentric. Um, Post-colonial um, law is mutually determined. Um, the public participates or can participate. There may be interveners in the court. We have that in Canada. Um, parties are treated equally. Um, facts need to be supported by proof. Um, the concept of law is consensual. Um, there are principled explanations. There's an important role for judges to explain why they came to the decision and how, and to base that on laws that are decided through egalitarian processes. And there is uh, respect and a place for people that might come from a different social background. Um, I, did, I filled out a form like this for every one of the judgments. Uh, there were 65 cases, but some of the cases had more than one judgment. But if anyone wants to look up the profiles that I made and the comments that I made to explain why um, a judgment scored, on one side or the other. Sometimes they scored on both sides because they might, um, a judge might make an egalitarian statement of the law, but then um, in other areas make a declaratory decision. Um, so um, these can be find, found on the internet. Um, 
http colons two slashes circle dot ubc dot ca slash handle slash two four two nine slash three four nine five nine um, maybe you can find it if you look on the UBC Press website. Um, to summarize ex very greatly, um, the average scores that I um, got when I checked for indicia of one form of law or the other, um, for cases involving indigenous parties, the indigenous parties, uh, those decisions were uh, scored eight on the colonial side and 4.9, not quite five, on the post-colonial side. Whereas um, some of the cases where there were non-indigenous parties, it was only 4.2 on the colonial side and 8.7 on the post-colonial side. Some of the difference of the score has to do with the fact that the judges in almost every case were for the indigenous parties, alien decision makers who were acting with an imposed identity and who were forcing indigenous peoples to defend their rights before a foreign language, uh, foreign culture in, in a foreign language. The area where the court did best consistently was on procedure. Uh, generally speaking, in most of the cases, um, they scored on the post-colonial side for procedure, though there were some uh, places where um, there were um, biased um, or in-camera uh, parts of the process. Um, I, can't, I don't have time to go through all of the cases and all the things I found. I didn't even have time to put all of them in my thesis and I had time to put less of them in the book. Uh, you could, you know, once you start looking for these indicia, you find very many of them, and it's too many to comment on. It would drive people nuts with boredom, I think. <laughs> but um, you can see pretty clearly what's happening from an indigenous point of view if you look at the results of some of the cases. In Noah Egic, the court stated that laws should be given a liberal construction in favor of the Indians, and that all ambiguities should be decided in favor of the Indians. Um, this principle was repeated in a great number of cases. Instead of saying Indians, they often said Aboriginal people um, in more recent years. Um, however, the results didn't change. Um, in 30 of the cases, began when indigenous peoples were charged. Um, 99 people were charged in 30 cases. Um, of the 90 people who were charged, 70 were convicted. Only 14 were acquitted. And 15 had the issue sent back to trial. So um, it wasn't very satisfactory. Um, from the perspective of the Indians or indigenous people or aboriginals, whatever, often they didn't even identify the nation that these people came from. Um, if someone is hunting, for example, on territory where their ancestors have hunted for generations since time immemorial, um, I think from their perspective, they were just hunting on land that their ancestors had hunted on since time immemorial. I don't think they set out to break Canadian laws. And if, certainly if Canada had been acting under the British paradigm, they wouldn't have been under Canadian laws. They would have been under the laws of their own people. Um, another prominent anomaly is, is the court's declaration that the Crown um, has a trust-like rather than an adversarial role to play. Um, that may be the way the court sees it. However, in the 65 cases that I studied, the Crown intervened, the Federal Crown intervened in 22 cases. The Provincial Crown intervened in 37 cases. I didn't find any indication that the Crown ever intervened to support 
an indigenous perspective. Um, there were absolutely none. Um, there were lots of indications that the Crown intervened to oppose an indigenous perspective. So it's very hard to see how the Crown is acting um, in a trust-like relationship with indigenous peoples. It's the same thing um, for a lot of the mismanagement that's happened, for money that's gone onto reserves, uh, supposedly to make um, uh, clean water treatment and so on, and the companies that have done it have done a bad job and left people with poisoned water. But you don't see a lot of cases where the Department of Justice is rushing to prosecute those companies. It's a whole gap in legal practice that one would expect to be there if things were really equal. I don't know if this is the right order to put this in terms of this talk, but in my book, when I started examining the difficulties of, uh, involved in reconciling indigenous perspectives with the perspective of the judges of the Supreme Court, um, one of the most fundamental is the concept of what social order is. The court wants to support social order. However, the Canadian concept of social order is generally pyramidal, um, like a pyramid. Um, you can see that in the idea of the protection of the crown. Um, at one time in the Canadian Constitution, uh, provincial and federal jurisdictions were considered to be equal or parallel, but eventually they developed the uh, principle of crown paramountcy. So federal law was paramount over provincial law when there was a conflict. Um, there's a really strong tendency, um, as I started to think about it, uh, it's even in our language, uh, in, in the way we structure uh, or think about grammar in English, um, a lot of hierarchical relations. And so um, on the Supreme Court of Canada website, we're told that the Supreme Court of Canada stands at the apex of the Canadian judicial system. The Canadian courts may be seen as a pyramid. Uh, it's very explicit. It's explicit in the way the Canadian Constitution is described to people, in the way ordinary voters are described as grassroots and so forth. Um, the Haudenosaunee model for their constitution is very egalitarian. And as I started to study it, what I suddenly realized is that one thing that's important in the cultural differences is what's right in the center of the circle. There's nothing there. There is no um, head of state among the Haudenosaunee. They have a lot of representatives. The representatives, each of those strings, uh, it represents one of the representatives on their council. And the strings have many beads, some of them dark, some of them light. And that represents the fact that each representative represents many people. And there is, in that social system, there's a requirement for a great deal of consultation. You can't just go ahead and vote the way you want once you get on council. You have to consult with the people you represent. So some of their processes are slow because there has to be time for a lot of representation. There was also a very strongly developed concept of alliance, relationships with other states, and it was represented with linking hand symbolism in um, a lot of the wampum that were made to commemorate um, to commemorate uh, treaties that were made. And I, I might um, I, I think there's been a bit of a discussion. Some people think that there is an original or better wampum, but these wampum were taken apart and put together again. It's the idea represented by the design that's important. And so I, I've actually gone over the time I was supposed to take for this presentation. Um, and so I can't get too much into the second part of the book that has a lot of detailed discussions of exactly where the court fell into colonial modes of reasoning. Um, I looked at the judicial role the judge's concept of their role. And um, they do 
have a tendency to think that they have a right to make a decision for the rest of us when they're in uncertainties. There is not a tendency to refer things, to define an issue and refer it to Parliament, for example. Um, the social background of the judges, most of them come from relatively well-off uh, middle-class families, and most of them went straight through law school, straight from high school to university to law school. There's relatively little experience of the broader world that the rest of us live in. And this is reflected in their decision in the firearms reference, which I discuss. There's a radical difference between the way urban people and rural people uh, see that issue. There's a, a difference between Western Canada and Central Canada, I would say between Montreal and uh, Saskatchewan, or between Montreal and Northern Newfoundland, where a lot of people still do make their living off the land and off the sea. Um, in uh, R. V. Mikau, uh, it was a case where an indigenous person was arrested for fishing without a permit on his reserve. And his reserve actually had fishing reg regulations, but they weren't even mentioned by the judges. The judges didn't consider the effect of the regulations. Um, they just said that um, the, the guy should get a fishing permit. <laughs> um, because how else could you tell that he was an Indian? So I guess they didn't even know that people with Indian status usually have status cards. So um, if he had a status card, you'd be able to tell that he was under indigenous jurisdiction. And it may seem strange to expect that indigenous jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictions could be recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada, but they have been recognized by the courts in, the, uh, in Australia, which is under the same kind of system. And certain issues they recognize have to be decided within juris the jurisdiction of the in Aboriginal people there. And um, they've also found that there was Aboriginal title underlying the city of Perth. Um, they found that there could be Aboriginal title even if settlers were living on the land. Um, another area I looked at was the use of categorization, uh, categorization by the judges. And um, categorization usually uses a container metaphor, something's in a category or out of it. That's not the way we really think. Um, we really form our categories based on our personal experience, and then we generalize on the basis of that. So if I say I'm going home, um, the idea of home, the way I see it, might be a house in a suburb because that's where I grew up. But for someone else, it might be a house in an apartment building because that's where they grew up. And there's a lot of um, misunderstanding because of that, and there's a lot of intercultural misunderstanding. I think that's one of the reasons why people in the dominant population were so slow to recognize the problem made by the residential schools, because most of us, when we went to school, uh, school was a very friendly place, and it never crossed our mind that it would be so horrible for someone else. And the people that went to horrible residential schools probably just assumed that we knew what they were being subjected to. And there was so little intercultural communication that people didn't know. Um, there is a need for a lot more of institutions of communication. Um, I also looked at the frames of reference that were applied by the judges and um, demonstrated how uh, some of the major principles um, like the use of sui generis. I, I've already talked about the uh, trust-like, uh, the Noagegic principle of interpretation in favor of the Indians and the Crown's trust-like rather than adversarial role. Um, there was a, there's also been a tendency to say that uh, indigenous treaties are sui generis. I don't know why, but it's, it's a kind of way of uh, avoiding the embarrassment involved in finding that Canada's actually violated international law. 
and the way it's interpreted and understood those treaties. Um, there's also the Vanderpeet test that um, states that in order to be an Aboriginal life, it has to be integral to an, a distinctive culture. And the court seems to have decided that in order to be a distinctive culture, um, it has to be something that was being done at the time of contact and hasn't changed. So uh, in, in the court's mind, it seems not to be permissible for indigenous people to move into the modern world or to have a jurisdiction like other people have. Uh, if I look at the trends of what happened um, in the 25 year period that I looked at those cases, though nothing has changed since 2006, the last case that was considered in the book. In fact, it may have gotten worse. Um, the judges have the perception that the world has changed and that they've liberalized greatly the uh, support for indigenous rights. However, indigenous people like Wanda McCaslin, who is um, a very, not a very in-your-face kind of person, she's very easy to get along with kind of person, but uh, as she says and as so many indigenous people see, the patterns of harm and abuse are continuing today. Um, and um, I think Thomas Kuhn's observation that anomalies, and there is an anomaly um, in the conflict between the values expressed by the judges and the actual effect of their decisions. Um, this is not necessarily going to induce a crisis. There's going to be a tendency for people to, con for anyone perhaps, but the indigenous people who continue to struggle to find a way to obtain equitable treatment. Um, so um, what we really need to do, I think, if we want to change things and to solve the so-called Indian problem, I don't think the problem is with the indigenous people, I think the problem is with Canada. Um, but what we need to do is to develop a paradigm for intercultural relations that's mutually acceptable. And it would help if Canadians remembered the British part of our heritage that required acceptance of other jurisdictions. Um, that model didn't really work well because it allowed colonization to happen, but we could look at why abuse arose in that situation and try to design institutions that will improve that. Um, I, I also think that change will only happen if we acknowledge history. I think we, we tend to take an ostrich in the sand approach to history. We don't want to study history. Um, recently, I was on the BC ferries. I've just been over to visit members of the Halkamidum Treaty Group whose land was taken away and uh, given to the um, Nanaimo and Esquimalt Nanaimo Railway. And um, there was a nice little article in a magazine on the BC ferries about the first railway on Vancouver Island. And they failed to mention anything about what happened to the people whose land was taken, even though there was lots of information there to be had. And I think we need to start integrating what happened to indigenous peoples, what happened to other cultural groups, um, to our concept of Canada. We, we can acknowledge that there were things that were wrong in the past and get past them. There's no point in pretending that we're all goody two-shoes who never did anything wrong or that our ancestors were. So, thank you. And I, I hope, um, I, this has been a very rough overview of what's in the book. Um, I hope people will be able to get hold of a copy of the book from the library or to buy one, the UBC Press is here. Um, UBC Press also published um, Sean, uh, uh, Richard Atlio's book, which I think is very interesting. It helps people to understand that the stories of his people were not just sort of quaint little fables about ravens and mucus, uh, clam or something. You know, they all have uh, layers of meaning that um, we might miss. There, there's a highly developed philosophy there. And according to that philosophy, our society is only in its infancy.
So we should be brave enough to try to grow up. Thank you.